Okay. <coughs> Here's a very famous, a historically famous problem from Al-Khwarizmi's algebra. This is how it was written. Now, it doesn't look like algebra today, but it's all language, all words. Let me give you, well, actually, let me read it out. Because this was a, 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 a modern translation, a fairly literal translation from Al-Khwarizmi's book. If someone say, you divide 10 into two parts, multiply the one by itself, it will be equal to the other taken 81 times. Computation. You say 10 less thing, that's going to be a 10, but it's less something, it's a diminished 10. Multiplied by itself is 100 plus a square, less 20 things. So the less doesn't mean you're subtracting, it means it's reduced somehow. And this is equal to 81 things. Separate the 20 things from 100 and square, and a square, and add them to 81. It will then be 100 plus a square, which is equal to 101 roots. Halve the roots. The moiety, and we'll come back to that in a minute, is 50 and a half. Multiply this by itself. It is 2,550 and a quarter. Subtract from this 100. The remainder is 2,450 and a quarter. Extract the root from this. It is 49 and a half. Subtract this from the moiety of the roots, which is 50 and a half. There remains one, and this is one of the two parts. Uh, most of us would find that quite challenging to, uh, to understand. Um, let me take you out of your misery. <laughs> they were solving this. You've got a 10 slimmed down by an amount x. You're squaring it, and you get 81. That's the solution to that. And actually, if you follow that through, that's just the, the, sort of like the way we might solve the equation. I'm not going to go through the details, but it's sort of like the way you, you, you sort, of, sort of follow that through and understand what you would do. Um, bearing in mind that they didn't have negatives, but they could move things from one side to the other. I'm going to move on. <laughs> you know, it, it was really just, it, 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 I didn't want you to spend a lot of time on that. It's just to show you that, uh, the way uh, it was laid out. Uh, much simpler, we would think, to just solve that equation because we reduced algebra to very much just symbolic manipulation. I mean, the point about solving that quadratic is you can do it without switching your brain on. Once you know the methods, you can just grind the handle. Uh, it's very much algorithmic. OK, so that was al -Khwarizmi. I will mention that uh, al -Khwarizmi, because he was describing procedures for doing arithmetic, especially in his first book, well, actually in both books, it gave rise to the modern word algorithm. So the word algorithm for a computational procedure is derived from al -Khwarizmi's, uh, So he's, he's, he's left the world with two words, algorithm and algebra. Pretty, pretty significant. Okay, uh, so that was al -Khwarizmi. And there's another nice picture uh, from one of the, the books. Then um, the next major figure, almost immediately afterwards, was Abu Kamil, a guy who wrote a, many books, at least 10 of which we know, uh, did a whole bunch of things, a uh, really dramatic individual, remarkable individual, uh, he actually used that equation to solve, uh, to calculate the side of a regular pentagon. Uh, so, really kind of remarkable piece of work. Um, and the guy was so sort of amazing and obsessive, one might say, that in one case, he looked at many what's known as indeterminate problems, problems where there's not a unique solution, but there are many solutions. And in one case, he actually went through and found 2,676 solutions, hand calculation of all those many solutions. Uh, well, there, there were fewer distractions then, right? So it was uh, uh, even so, that's that's pretty remarkable. Um, uh, the next major figure, and there were, there were a lot of people involved. This was a huge uh, enterprise going on. I'm just mentioning some of the more famous people. Uh, and then we've got Al Karahi, um, recognised that the sequence well. That first remark is really a modern interpretation of what he did. You have to sort of read it with modern eyes, but essentially he realized that you can keep running up the exponents indefinitely. Um, likewise, from a modern perspective, he discovered proof by induction, the, the method of proof by induction where you prove the first case and then you show that if it's true for n, it's true for n plus 1, for those of you who've been through that kind of an education. Um, it's not explicit in his work, but it's certainly implicit. And um, some of the historians I talked to said, yeah, it's a little bit of a stretch to call it induction. Uh, but from my perspective as a mathematician, it was induction. Um, it depends how you define it. I could certainly look at it and see induction. 
Um, and uh, he verified this, which um, is typically done today by induction, that the sum of the first n cubed is that formula. Uh, I think actually that's on, I think that problem is on the test, the problem sheet that I'm uh, handing out to my students in my online class today. If it's not today, it's on Wednesday, so uh, don't tell them. Right? It's a, I, think they've got, I think I'm asking them to prove this one as an example of induction proofs. Uh, he wrote at least three books. Uh, then there's the famous Omar Khayyam, um, I mean, known more in the West as a poet. Um, I never thought his poetry was that good, but his mathematics was brilliant. And I think the fact he's known as a poet reflects more on our values in society, where we value poetry above mathematics. I, I wouldn't change the balance the other way. I'd say I wouldn't want to put them on a balance. They're both important things. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, but he certainly did some uh, spectacular mathematics, works on astronomy, calendar reform, a very significant figure, uh, very, very detailed cataloging of things, uh, all the possible kinds of equations, relating them to geometric constructions. You, his book is, is, is easily available in at least three translations, including one as recent as last year. Um, solved cubics using various intricate instructions involving conic sections, uh, methods that are sometimes taught today in, in, in classes that focus on that kind of thing. Um, and actually looked at uh, the issue of things that could, could and couldn't be solved by ruler and compass methods. So was very much into the kind of things that are still, at least in high school geometry courses, still very much uh, the focus. There's a, a rather nice picture from this manuscript of the cubic equations and the intersection of conic sections. Okay. And then uh, this amazing person uh, did a whole bunch of things. Uh, certainly a child prodigy, wrote over 80 books and articles, uh, got involved in all sorts of other enterprises. Uh, Samuel. And... Uh, this is really a sort of a quotation from, I mean, this is a quotation from, from one of his writings. He said that algebra involves, quote, operating on unknowns using all the arithmetical tools in the same way as the arithmetician operates on the known. That nails that distinction between algebra and, 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 and arithmetic. You're using arithmetical tools, but you're doing it at a different level of abstraction. You're doing it on the unknowns, which means you're sort of doing logical reasoning with them you're doing qualitative reasoning in an arithmetic framework as opposed to calculating with the numbers. And he, uh, among the things he did uh, was prove this result for the sums of the squares. Again, that's expressing it in modern notation. Uh, so absent the notation, you've got an awful lot of modern algebra being on uh, this period. Um, the, the story then picks up by Leonardo and then if we've satisfied with Leonardo, we can pick up essentially the same story in terms of spreading the word with Steve Jobs. So that was uh, a quick tour to algebra, the history of algebra up to essentially to modern times. Stanford University.